Well, good afternoon, sisters and brothers. I am honored to be here to speak on an issue that is near and dear to my heart, and that is state federations and our affiliates. I had this great idea on how to illustrate the role of a state fed. I, I had this big jar of rocks, and I was trying to get it through the security, and guess what? You can't take rocks on an airplane. Uh, so it was confiscated. But the rocks were signify what the, our affiliates are. Sometimes they're connected, sometimes they're not, and there are voids between them. What connects them is the sand that I would have poured into the jar, and we became a united labor movement. Understand something, federations exist because of you, the affiliates. The way I look at it, each month, affiliates invest in our federations through your per caps. And our programs as federation are designed to add value to your programs. Our political program is an excellent example of adding value. In 2010, the Oregon AFL-CIO stopped contributing to candidates and dedicated all our political funding to build the biggest political field program in Oregon. By focusing on, our, on field, our affiliates don't, enable them, enabling them to in, increase their political funding. Our voter file is over 300,000, and when you include our members, they're household members and working America. In 2016, we made over 260,000 phone calls. We knocked on 150,000 doors, and we delivered 600,000 pieces of mail. One third of our activity was outside of the Portland area, and the program works. In 2016, our voting bloc voted five points higher than the general public. And exit polling revealed that 75% of the time they voted for our endorsed candidate. In an off-year election like 2018, our voting bloc will turn out seven to 10 points higher than the general public. Our program makes a difference. And to ensure that we have union members in elected office, the Labor Candidate School was established in 2012. The school conducts regional trainings throughout the state. Today, we have 14 union members who serve in the Oregon legislature, four in the Senate, 10 in the House. Let me tell you something. Having union members chairing committees make a big difference. The chair of the Business and Labor Committee in Oregon is a carpenter. He has this really bad habit. He kills bad bills. Like our political program, our legislative program is driven by our affiliates. Our program provides for those affiliates who don't have a program. We, be, we are their lobbyists. We keep them informed and we drive their legislative agenda. And for those affiliates that do have programs in our capital, we augment that. And every week we bring all the labor lobbyists together. We also move a legislative agenda for the overall labor movement. For example, we pass legislation that prohibits local government from enacting right to work. For public sector organizing, we have card check and employer neutrality. We also move an agenda for non-union workers, minimum wage, overtime protection, worker scheduling, family leave, the ability to bring workers from red areas of the state to testify and meet with legislators has been a success story for us and makes our program stronger. We have this capability because we have full-time staff in the three largest metropolitan areas outside of Portland. In 2015, working with the national AFL-CIO, we appointed a subcommittee of our executive board to evaluate our central body structure. Keep in mind, 65% of Oregon lives in the Portland metro area. The Portland CLC is a big one. It has over 45,000 members. They have resources and full-time staff. But you get outside the metro area and you'll find that the biggest central labor body is 15,000 volunteer leadership. It's very difficult to lead program. The committee came up with a recommendation that except, that except for the Portland CLC, CLCs would become a chapter of the Oregon AFL-CIO. This structure creates greater ability, accountability, and coordination of program. And by capturing CLC funding, we partially funded those field staff. Not only do the field staff drive our political program in the regions, but we complement the work of our affiliates. When AFSCME went on strike in Eugene for eight days, we turned our staff over to their campaign. 
Our staff's ability in the region to complement our affiliates' efforts creates greater buy-in and greater activity from those affiliates who find themselves stretched thin outside of Portland. In 2011, we partnered with the National AFL-CIO, their organizing department, and bank began the process of developing the first state Fed organizing program. We appointed a small committee of presidents and organizing directors of affiliates with dedicated organizing staff. The program includes a full-time researcher, lead organizer, and the program breaks down like this. For those affiliates who don't have an organizing program, we are the program. We're lead workers. We get the organizers. We do the coordination. And for those affiliates that have organizing capabilities, we augment the program. Our first organizing target was 150 transit workers for ATU at a private sector, this was a private sector organizing target. We led the program, but ATU was front and center in the all important uh, organizing committee meetings. We were successful. AFT requested that the committee help with a Head Start unit at a, one of our community colleges. AFT has an organizing program with dedicated staff, but they were on another pro project. Our lead organizer ran the program, and here's the exciting part. Our organizing committee developed a three-day house blitz program of 30 different organizers from six different affiliates. We had building trades, manufacturing, public sector. That's the power of the federation. This was a public sector organizing drive. We had the card check option. And when the community college began an anti-organizing campaign, we went to work. We called board members at the community colleges. We called the state senator and the legislator from that, ho from that ho house district. We also called the governor and the speaker of the house, and we stopped the anti-organizing drive dead in its tracks, and we won. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the PSB organizing uh, too much. I think Chad did a really good job, but I do want to talk about my organizer who worked on the floor of that, that facility for three months. She got to know folks, she brought us information, and she was appalled by the deplorable working conditions that she saw there. We, we also use political relationships to facilitate organizing. During the development of an RFP for an Oregon Convention headquarters hotel, we made sure that labor peace language was included. And when the project was awarded, we worked with three different governments who refused to sign on to the agreement until Unite Here had their peace agreement, and it's a beauty. Card check, neutrality, access, and binding ARB on first contracts. Currently, we're working with Major League Baseball. They want to come to Portland, they want our help, and we want it built union, and we want it op operated by union workers. We developed a labor peace language coordinating the efforts of eight different affiliates. State Fed staffing. It needs to be configured in a way that meet the needs of our affiliates. A good example was the PSB organizing program. Our communications department did all the lit, put the pictures together, did about anything that Local 114 and Terry asked them to do. We save money for our affiliates because we're involved in web design, and data collection. We also can develop a communications program, and we design all our print material in-house, and most of our affiliates use this, saving thousands and thousands of dollars. State feds must be nimble. In Oregon, we began preparing for a federal court case that would establish right to work for public sector workers in 2015. We formed a committee of affiliate leaders and organizing directors who met monthly Converting most of our organizing capability from external to internal organizing, and because of our ability to work with and develop program with our affiliates, we experienced high conversion rates from fair share members to full membership. Ask me, increase their membership to over 90%. AFT increased their membership by 7.5%. Now the Koch brothers, they've been in Oregon for a long time, long time. But their activity right now is intensified. They're going door to door. They're mailings, emails. They have websites. They're making it very easy for workers to drop their membership. It's early, 
But because we have an ongoing internal organizing program, to a certain degree, we've inoculated our membership and the Freedom Foundations. So sad, they're having a really tough go of it. We had an uh, executive board meeting last me week, and one of the affiliates reported that for every member who drops, they're picking up three fair share members because of the internal organizing drive. <clears throat> The recent Janus decision, 28 states, oops, I said 28, 27 states because we kicked some ass for the working class in Missouri. We know that the Koch brothers, the Right to Work Foundation, and corporate America has a plan for workers. They want to destroy our unions, private and public. They want to limit, eliminate the collective power of workers and silence our voice. Yeah, they have a plan for the workers of the, our countries. Well, you know what Mike Tyson used to say about plans, right? Everybody has a plan until I punch them in the face. <laughs> workers are looking for a better life. And with few exceptions, they don't trust politicians, government, or the establishment. More and more workers are looking to the union movement as a vehicle of change. Recent polling showed that over 60% of Americans support unions. That's the highest rating in over three decades. And that number's even higher among millennials. Last year, for the first time in this century, our movement actually grew by 262,000 members. This organizing is across the board. In Oregon, we grew by 34,000 members. And in Texas, where for public sector workers, it's against the law to collectively bargain, they grew by 80,000 members. Once again, workers are using the strike to achieve a better life, better wages, better working conditions. Unions are standing up to corporate bullies like Nabisco, and teachers from West Virginia to Arizona have taken to the streets not only to improve their living standards, but to increase funding for education. The Me Too movement, workers on strike across America, vast marches in protest, and the increased numbers of workers joining unions are not only components of a backlash, but a symptom of our nation's effort to readjust our course back to an America that works for all and not just a privileged few. <laughs> to succeed for workers, the union movement must remember our history a history of collective action, a history of gaining power and organizing in a time before there was even labor law. Our success as a movement doesn't depend on the whim of a politician or a text of a president or a Supreme Court decision. Our future is determined by the worker. Our power was and is bold, aggressive, collective action. We as a movement have to get out of our comfort zone and develop aggressive strategies that build wealth for our members and become a beacon of hope for non-union workers. As long as workers dream of a better life, there'll be a union movement. You know, looking out over the crowd, I know you're all union folks, and every single one of you came for, to the union for a reason. It just doesn't happen. Every one of you have your own story. I have a story. My dad had a ninth grade education. And for a big portion of his life, he had a really tough go. He found himself 34 years old, trapped in dead end jobs. He had two kids. Government helped us out. We got powdered milk and cheese and some nasty peanut butter. And some of you in the crowd know what I'm talking about. And every day he went, got up and he went to work pumping gas and parking cars. One day he opened up the paper, and in that paper, in that paper was an ad. It was an ad for a manufacturing job, a union job. The only problem was you had to have a high school education. Well, my dad went down there, came back, and he had the job. You see, he lied. He said he had a high school, and he said, if I'm going to lie, I'm going to throw a couple years of college in. But you have to understand something. Like many of you, 
He'd do anything to get that union card because that union card was power. That union card was a power to lift our family out of poverty. That card has a power to educate your kids and secure a better future for them. That card can change the course of this country. The greatest gift, as far as I am concerned, that you can give a worker is a union card. There is no problem in this country we cannot address with, with, that isn't addressed by a union job. My sisters and brothers, I'm going to leave you with this. Never forget who you are. It doesn't matter if you're in Canada or America. You're the union movement. We're the ones who plant the crops and push the mops. We feed this country. We build it, the bridges, the roads, the cars, the trucks, rail. We educate our kids. We keep people safe, and we tend them when they're sick. We are the workers' movement. We don't run. We don't hide. We don't retreat. We put our country, we wake our country up every morning and put our country to bed at night. Today, more than ever, we stand united, we stand strong, and we stand divisive. Thank you.